Bonjour mes amis, welcome back. I'm Christina, the manager of the Pacific Beach Library. Thank you for joining me for day 54 of our read along together of The Count of Monte Cristo. We're so close to the end of this story. There has been so much happening and yeah, we've just got two more days this week to kind of wrap up a few more threads. Um, let's start out because there's so much exciting stuff going on with something cool and refreshing to tide us over. I once again brewed some Earl Grey tea, um, but I decided this time to pour it over a glass of ice. So we're gonna have an iced Earl Grey tea today. Oof. Mm. On its way to cool down, it should be perfect in about a minute or so. Mm. So good, I love Earl Grey tea. Okay, so I thought we'd start out by talking a little bit about the chapters we read yesterday. Um, yesterday we read three chapters, 99 through 101. Chapter 99 was entitled The Law, dun, dun, dun. Um, and in that one, it was basically Madame Danglars' reaction to the news of her daughter, um, her daughter's engagement to Andrea Cavalcanti falling apart because Andrea was arrested. And initially she doesn't realize it's such a big deal and it starts out with her going to visit Lucien de Bray to talk about it but he's not home. He's actually at his friends, with his friends at a club talking about the scandal that happened at the party at the Dong Lars home. Interestingly enough, in that they also refer to the possibility of um, Lucien de Bray being engaged to um, Eugenie Dong Lars, which again, ew, um, we know that he's dating her mom or having, a, having an affair with her mom. It's just, ew, okay, sorry. Ew, okay, leaving that aside. Um, so they, um, um, so she then goes home he's again he's not home to her so she sleeps and when she wakes up the next morning she realizes you know this isn't just embarrassing this is really scandalous this is a very bad thing that this engagement has fallen apart so publicly and that Andrea has been again accused of such a serious crime and she realizes that the person she needs to speak to is Monsieur de Villefort both because he is the magistrate he is you know involved with the law he's a judge but also because they have a past relationship um, that, you know, he had been her secret lover back when she was married to Monsieur Nargon, and she even bore him a child, which they don't know, but we know that that child was Benedetto, who is actually Andrea Cavalcante, who's the man who didn't marry her daughter. Whew, scandal. So she goes to speak with Villafort because she's hoping that she can um, use that sympathy, that past relationship, as part of um, what might help sway him not to prosecute Andrea Cavalcanti, perhaps to let him either not be arrested or if he is arrested to let him escape, um, just, or just to put it off for at least six more months until they have time to get their affairs in order. Um, and he basically says, you've got a little problem that you're dealing with, but it is not nearly as bad as the problem I'm dealing with. There's a poisoner in my house. My daughter's almost dead. You've got a little problem to deal with and you've got no sympathy from me basically. And so he um, he tells her that you know he he cannot stop the the wheels of justice from turning. That the telegraph had already been sent out that the gendarmes are searching across France for Andrea Cavalcanti already, and there's nothing he can do. And indeed, before the conclusion of their visit together, he receives notice that Andrea Cavalcanti has been arrested. And so she leaves, um, and he basically says, you know, it's going to happen. Sorry, there's nothing I can do. The scene then switches um, to the home of the Villaforts, and we actually, um, chapter 100, the apparition focuses on um, Valentine de Villafort, who has been ill since, the, um, since she passed out before Eugenie Danglars and her mother announced the engagement. So four days have passed since that, that episode. And during that time, she has been isolated in her room. Only her father and the doctor care for her. They bring in, they're very careful about bringing in the medicines that are, you know, strictly made by the doctor. No one else is seeing these. The, she is, you know, she seems to recover and then she falls down again. You know, so, so her health is not recovering well, but she is not dying yet. So it's, it's a very, she's in a kind of like in between state. And what happens that evening of the fourth day after the um, after she passed out is that she seems to be having a vision and she realizes that somebody is actually in her room that she is not imagining at this time because she's she's had moments where she thought there were people in her room and it, you know she's she's just very confused she's in a delirious state but she realizes that there actually is somebody in the room 
and because as she's reaching to take a drink from her like from her bedside table she's reaching for a table to take a drink and somebody stops her arm so she cannot bring that drink to her mouth and she realizes eventually that person is real and it is the Count of Monte Cristo oh, he's everywhere and so the Count of Monte Cristo stops her from drinking that beverage and what he tells her is that I have been watching over you you have no reason to fear me I come to you because I love you like a father because I love Maximilian Morel and he loves you and so as soon as she hears that he's affiliated with Maximilian she is reassured that the Count of Monte Cristo does not mean her harm and what he tells her is basically that he has taken the house next door that he has created a secret passage so that he can watch her room basically and check to make sure that she is safe and he's been watching her for the past four days and that he has seen somebody giving her poison and that he has been coming in before she, Valentine has a chance to take the poison and you know substituting it with something that will help her and so she basically says so you've seen who is attempting to take my life and she's like he says yes watch now pretend to be asleep and you will see who comes in chapter 101 is called Lacusta and as I'd mentioned yesterday Lacusta is a reference to a very famous poisoner uh, during the Roman era and um, we find in this chapter that Valentine sees somebody come in, sees somebody pour um, a little file, like a, a little glass, empty a little glass container into Valentine's cup. And it, she sees that the person who has been poisoning her is her stepmother, Madame de Villefort. And so Madame de Villefort has been poisoning Valentine, and Valentine is shocked, you know. When her stepmother leaves the room, she's, again, still stunned, and the Count of Monte Cristo comes in, and Valentine cannot make head or tails of it. She can't make sense of it. And she, the Count of Monte Cristo explains to her that the reason that Madame de Villefort is poisoning Valentine is the same reason she poisoned Monsieur and Madame de Saint-Marin, the same reason she tried to poison Monsieur um, de Noirtier but accidentally poisoned his servant Barois instead, she's trying to have this money, the you know the inheritance of all these folks go to Valentine and then kill Valentine off, so that the only heir can be her own son, um, Edward de Villefort, who is you know the less favored child of Noirtier and the Saint Marans because well he's not related to the Saint Marans at all but you know the whole thing he's she's trying to um, consolidate all those inheritance for her own son, and so um, Valentine just can't fathom it. She's like you know why would you do such a thing? It's, money, you know, but that is what Madame de Villefort has been doing. What Monte Cristo then does is something interesting. He speaks to Valentine and says, will you trust me? Will you trust me and take this, this medicine that it might make, it might make some things kind of weird for you. You might, you might lose sight, hearing, consciousness. You might even wake up in a sepulchral vault or a, or a coffin. It sounds very Romeo and Juliet to me when she, you know, they have her fake death and everything and she wakes up in the, in the vault or mausoleum of the Capulets. But um, it sounds so, sort of similar to that, that he's saying, you know, will you trust me and take, this, take some medicine that will basically give you the appearance of death? And she's like, yes, yes, I will. I'll trust you. You're, you're here with Maximilian, sure. And so Valentine takes the medicine that, she, that he gives her, and um, she promises not to fear. So now, let's see what happens as a result of her trusting the Count of Monte Cristo. Today we're going to read three chapters, 103, 104, or sorry, 102, 103, and 104. Oh, my iced tea is perfect. It's time to get started with our reading. So let's start out with chapter 102, Valentine. The night light continued to burn on the chimney piece, exha exhausting the last drops of oil which floated on the surface of the water. The globe of the lamp appeared of a reddish hue, and the flame, brightening before it expired, threw out the last flickerings which an inanimate object have been so often compared with the convulsions of a human creature in its final agonies. A dull and dismal light was shed over the bedclothes and curtains surrounding the young girl. All noise in the streets had ceased, and the silence was frightful. It was then that the door of Edward's room opened, and a head we have before noticed appeared in the glass opposite. It was Madame de Villefort, who came to witness the effects of the drink she had prepared. She stopped in the doorway, listened for a moment to the flickering of the lamp, the only sound in that deserted room, and then advanced to the table to see if Valentine's glass were empty. It was still about a quarter full, as we before stated, 
Madame de Villefort emptied the contents into the ashes, which she disturbed that they might the more readily absorb the liquid. Then she carefully rinsed the glass, and wiping it with her handkerchief, replaced it on the table. If anyone could have looked into the room just then, he would have noticed the hesitation with which Madame de Villefort approached the bed and looked fixedly on Valentine. The dim light, the profound silence, and the gloomy thoughts inspired by the hour, and still more by her own conscience, all combined to produce a sensation of fear. The poisoner was terrified at the contemplation of her own work. At length she rallied, drew aside the curtain, and leaning over the pillow gazed intently on Valentine. The young girl no longer breathed. No breath issued through the half-closed teeth. The white lips no longer quivered. The eyes were suffused with a bluish vapor, and the long black lashes rested on a cheek, white as wax. Madame de Villefort gazed upon the face so expressive even in its stillness. Then she ventured to raise the coverlet and press her hand upon the young girl's heart. It was cold and motionless. She only felt the pulsation in her own fingers and withdrew her hand with a shudder. One arm was hanging out of the bed. From shoulder to elbow, it was molded after the arms of Germaine Pilon's graces. But the forearm seemed to be slightly distorted by convulsion, and the hand, so delicately formed, was resting with stiff, outstretched fingers on the framework of the bed. The nails, too, were turning blue. Madame de Villefort had no longer any doubt. All was over. She had consummated the last terrible work she had to accomplish. There was no more to do in the room, so the poisoner retired stealthily, as though fearing to hear the sound of her own footsteps. But as she withdrew, she still held aside the curtain, absorbed in the irresistible attraction always exerted by the picture of death, so long as it is merely mysterious and does not excite disgust. The minutes passed. Madame de Villefort could not drop the curtain which she held like a funeral pall over the head of Valentine. She was lost in reverie, and the reverie of crime is remorse. Just then the lamp again flickered. The noise startled Madame de Villefort, who shuddered and dropped the curtain. Immediately afterwards the light expired, and the room was plunged in frightful obscurity, while the clock at that minute struck half past four. Overpowered with agitation, the poisoner succeeded in groping her way to the door and reached her room in an agony of fear. The darkness lasted two hours longer. Then by degrees, a cold light crept through the Venetian blinds until at length it revealed the objects in the room. About this time, the nurse's cough was heard on the stairs and the woman entered the room with a cup in her hand. To the tender eye of a father or a lover, the first glance would have sufficed to reveal Valentine's condition. But to this hireling, Valentine only appeared to sleep. Good, she exclaimed, approaching the table. She has taken part of her draught. The glass is three quarters empty. Then she went to the fireplace and lit the fire. And although she had just left her bed, she could not resist the temptation offered by Valentine's sleep. So she threw herself into an armchair to snatch a little more rest. The clock striking eight awoke her. Astonished at the prolonged slumber of the patient and frightened to see that the, that the arm was still hanging out of the bed, she advanced towards Valentine and for the first time noticed the white lips. She tried to replace the arm, but it moved with a frightful rigidity which could not deceive a sick nurse. She screamed aloud, then running to the door, exclaimed, Help! Help! What is the matter? asked Monsieur d'Avrigny at the foot of the stairs, it being the hour he usually visited her. What is it? asked Villefort, rushing from his room. Doctor, do you hear them call for help? Yes, yes. Let us hasten up. It was in Valentine's room. But before the doctor and the father could reach the room, the servants who were on the same floor had entered, and seeing Valentine pale and motionless on the bed, they lifted up their hands toward heaven and stood transfixed, as though struck by lightning. Call Madame de Villefort. Wake Madame de Villefort, cried the procureur from the, head of the, from the door of his chamber, which, which apparently he scarcely dared to leave. But instead of obeying him, the servants stood watching Monsieur d'Avrigny, who ran to Valentine and raised her in his arms. What? This one too? he exclaimed. Oh, where will be the end? Villefort rushed into the room. What are you saying, doctor? he exclaimed, raising his hands to heaven. 
I say that Valentine is dead, replied D'Avrigny, in a voice terrible in its solemn calmness. Monsieur de Villefort staggered and buried his head in the bed. On the exclamation of the doctor and the cry of the father, the servants all fled with muttered imprecations. They were heard running down the stairs and through the long passages. Then there was a rush in the court. Afterwards, all was still. They had, one and all, deserted the accursed house. Just then, Madame de Villefort, in the act of slipping on her dressing gown, threw aside the drapery and for a moment stood motionless, as though interrogating the occupants of the room, while she endeavored to call up some rebellious tears. On a sudden, she stepped, or rather bounded, with outstretched arms towards the table. She saw D'Avrigny curiously examining the glass, which she felt certain of having emptied during the night. It was now a third full, just as it was when she threw the contents into the ashes. The specter of Valentine rising before the poisoner would have alarmed her less. It was indeed the same color as the draught she had poured into the glass, and which Valentine had drunk. It was indeed the poison which could not deceive Monsieur d'Avrigny, which he now examined so closely. It was doubtless a miracle from heaven that, notwithstanding her precautions, there should be some trace, some proof remaining to reveal the crime. While Madame de Villefort remained rooted to the spot like a statue of terror, and Villefort, with his head hidden in the bedclothes, saw nothing around him, D'Avrigny approached the window, that he might the better examine the contents of the glass, and dipping the tip of his finger in, tasted it. Ah, he exclaimed, it is no longer brucine that is used. Let me see what it is. Then he ran to one of the cupboards in Valentine's room, which had been transformed into a medicine closet, and taking from its silver case a small bottle of nitric acid, dropped a little of it into the liquor, which immediately changed to a blood-red color. Ah, exclaimed D'Avrigny, in a voice in which the horror of a judge unveiling the truth was mingled with the delight of a student making a discovery. Madame de Villefort was overpowered. Her eyes first flashed and then swam. She staggered towards the door and disappeared. Directly afterwards, the distant sound of a heavy weight falling on the ground was heard, but no one paid any attention to it. The nurse was engaged in watching the chemical analysis, and Villefort was still absorbed in grief. Monsieur d'Avrigny alone had followed Madame de Villefort with his eyes and watched her hurried retreat. He lifted up the drapery over the entrance to Edward's room, and his eye reaching as far as Madame de Villefort's apartment, he beheld her extended lifeless on the floor. Go to the assistance of Madame de Villefort, he said to the nurse. Madame de Villefort is ill. But Mademoiselle de Villefort, stammered the nurse. Mademoiselle de Villefort no longer requires help, said D'Avrigny, since she is dead. Dead, dead, groaned forth Villefort in a paroxysm of grief, which was the more terrible from the novelty of the sensation in the iron heart of that man. Dead? repeated a third voice. Who said Valentine was dead? The two men turned round and saw Morel standing at the door, pale and terror-stricken. This is what had happened. At the usual time, Morel had presented himself at the little door leading to Noirtier's room. Contrary to custom, the door was open, and having no occasion to ring, he entered. He waited for a moment in the hall and called for a servant to conduct him to Monsieur Noirtier but no one answered, the servants having, as we know, deserted the house. Morel had no particular reason for uneasiness. Monte Cristo had promised him that Valentine should live, and so far he had always fulfilled his word. Every night the Count had given him news, which was the next morning confirmed by Noirtier. Still, this extraordinary silence appeared strange to him, and he called a second and third time. Still, no answer. Then he determined to go up, Noirtier's room was opened like all the rest. The first thing he saw was the old man sitting in his armchair in his usual place, but his eyes expressed alarm, which was confirmed by the pallor which overspread his features. "'How are you, sir?' asked Morel, with a sickness of heart. "'Well,' answered the old man, by closing his eyes, but his appearance manifested increasing uneasiness. "'You are thoughtful, sir,' continued Morel. "'You want something.' Shall I call one of the servants? 
Yes, replied Noirtier. Morel pulled the bell, but though he nearly broke the cord, no one answered. He turned towards Noirtier. The pallor and anguish expressed on his countenance momentarily increased. Oh, exclaimed Morel, why do they not come? Is anyone ill in the house? The eyes of Noirtier seemed as though they would start from their sockets. What is the matter? You alarm me. Valentine? Valentine? Yes, yes, signed Noirtier. Maximilian tried to speak, but he could articulate nothing. He staggered and supported himself against the wainscot. Then he pointed to the door. Yes, 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 continued the old man. Maximilian rushed up the little staircase while Noirtier's eyes seemed to say, quicker, quicker. In a minute, the young man darted through several rooms till at length he reached Valentine's. There was no occasion to push the door. It was wide open. A sob was the only sound he heard. He saw as though in a mist a black figure kneeling and buried in a confused mass of white drapery. A terrible fear transfixed him. It was then he heard a voice exclaim, Valentine is a dead, excuse me, Valentine is dead. And another voice which, like an echo, repeated, Dead, dead. Chapter 103, Maximilian. Villefort rose, half ashamed of being surprised in such a paroxysm of grief. The terrible office he had held for 25 years had succeeded in making him more or less than man. His glance, at first wandering, fixed itself upon Morel. Who are you, sir, he asked, that forget that this is not the manner to enter a house stricken with death? Go, sir go. But Morel remained motionless. He could not detach his eyes from that disordered bed and the pale corpse of the young girl who was lying on it. Go! Do you hear? said Villefort, while Daverny advanced to lead Morel out. Maximilian stared for a moment at the corpse, gazed all around the room, then upon the two men. He opened his mouth to speak, but finding it impossible to give utterance to the innumerable ideas that occupied his brain, he went out thrusting his hands through his hair in such a manner that Villefort and Daverny, for a moment diverted from the engrossing to topic, exchanged glances which seemed to say, he is mad. But in less than five minutes, the staircase groaned beneath an extraordinary weight. Morel was seen carrying, with superhuman strength, the armchair containing Noirtier upstairs. When he reached the landing, he placed the armchair on the floor and rapidly rolled it into Valentine's room. This could only have been accomplished by means of unnatural strength supplied by powerful excitement. But the most fearful spectacle was Noirtier being pushed towards the bed, his face expressing all his meaning and his eyes supplying the want of every other faculty. That pale face and flaming glance appeared to Villefort like a frightful apparition. Each time he had been brought into contact with his father, something terrible had happened. See what they have done, cried Morel, with one hand leaning on the back, excuse me, with one hand leaning on the back of the chair and the other extended towards Valentine. See, my father, see. Villefort drew back and looked with astonishment on the young man, who, almost a stranger to him, called Noirtier his father. At this moment, the whole soul of the old man seemed centered in his eyes, which became bloodshot. The veins of the throat swelled, his cheeks and temples became purple as though he was struck with epilepsy. Nothing was wanting to complete this but the utterance of a cry, and the cry issued from his pores. If we may thus speak, a cry frightful in its silence. Daverny rushed towards the old man and made him inhale a powerful restorative. Sir, cried Morel, seizing the moist hand of the paralytic, they ask me who I am and what right I have to be here. Oh, you know it. Tell them. Tell them. And the young man's voice was choked by sobs. As for the old man, his chest heaved with his panting respiration. One could have thought that he was undergoing the agonies preceding death. At length, happier than the young man who sobbed without weeping, tears glistened in the eyes of Noirtier. Tell them, said Morel in a hoarse voice, tell them that I am her betrothed. Tell them she was my beloved, my noble girl, my only blessing in the world. Tell them, oh, tell them, that corpse belongs to me. 
The young man, overwhelmed by the weight of his anguish, fell heavily on his knees before the bed, which his fingers grasped with convulsive energy. D'Avrigny, unable to bear the sight of this touching emotion, turned away, and Villefort, without seeking any further explanation, and attracted towards him by the irresistible magnetism which draws us toward those who have loved the people for whom, for whom we mourn, extended his hands toward the young man. But Morel saw nothing. He grasped the hand of Valentine, and unable to weep, vented his agony in groans as he bit the sheets. For some time, nothing was heard in that chamber but sobs, exclamations, and prayers. At length, Villefort, the most composed of all, spoke. Sir, said he to Maximilian, you say you loved Valentine, that you were betrothed to her. I knew nothing of this engagement, of this love. Yet I, her father, forgive you, for I see that your grief is real and deep. And besides, my own sorrow is too great for anger to find a place in my heart. But you see that the angel whom you hoped for has left this earth. She has nothing more to do with the adoration of men. Take a last farewell, sir, of her sad remains. Take the hand you expected to possess once more within your own, and then separate yourself from her forever. Valentine now requires only the ministrations of the priest. You are mistaken, sir, exclaimed Morel, raising himself on one knee, his heart pierced by a more acute pang than any he had yet felt. You are mistaken. Valentine, dying as she has, not only requires a priest, but an avenger. You, Monsieur de Villefort, send for the priest. I will be the avenger. What do you mean, sir? asked Villefort, trembling at the new idea inspired by the delirium of Morel. I tell you, sir, that two persons exist in you. The father has, um, has mourned sufficiently. Now let the procurer fulfill his office. The eyes of Noirtier glistened, and D'Avrigny approached. Gentlemen, said Morel, reading all that passed through the minds of the witnesses to the scene, I know what I am saying, and you know as well as I do what I am about to say. Valentine has been assassinated. Villefort hung his head. D'Avrigny approached nearer, and Noirtier said yes with his eyes. Now, sir, continued Morel, in these days no one can disappear by violent means without some inquiries being made as to the cause of her disappearance, even were she not a young, beautiful, and adorable creature like Valentine. Now, Monsieur le Procureur de Roi, said Morel, with increasing vehemence, no mercy is allowed. I denounce the crime. It is your place to seek the assassin. The young man's implacable eyes interrogated Villefort, who, on his side, glanced from Noirtier to D'Avrigny. But instead of finding sympathy in the eyes of the doctor and his father, he only saw an expression as inflexible as that of Maximilian. Yes, indicated the old man. Assuredly, said D'Avrigny. Sir, said Villefort, striving to struggle against this triple force and his own emotion. Sir, you are deceived. No one commits crimes here. I am stricken by fate. It is horrible indeed, but no one assassinates. The eyes of Noirtier lighted up with rage, and D'Avrigny prepared to speak. Morel, however, extended his arm and commanded silence. And I say that murders are committed here, said Morel, whose voice, though lower in tone, lost none of its terrible distinctness. I tell you that this is the fourth victim within the last four months. I tell you Valentine's life was attempted by poison four days ago, though she escaped owing to the precautions of Monsieur Noirtier. I tell you that the dose has been double, the poison changed, and that this time it has succeeded. I tell you that you know these things as well as I do, since this gentleman has forewarned you, both as a doctor and as a friend. Oh, you rave, sir, exclaimed Villefort, in vain endeavoring to escape the net in which he was taken. I rave, said Morel. Well, then, I appeal to Monsieur d'Avrigny himself. 
Ask him, sir, if he recollects the words he uttered in the garden of this house on the night of Madame de Saint Moran's death. You thought yourselves alone and talked about that tragical death and the fatality you mentioned then is the same which has caused the murder of Valentine. Villefort and Davigny exchanged looks. Yes, yes, continued Morel, recall the scene, for the words you thought were only given to silence and solitude fell into my ears. Certainly, after witnessing the culpable indolence manifested by Monsieur de Villefort towards his own relations, I ought to have denounced him to the authorities. Then I should not have been an accomplice to thy death, as I now am, sweet, beloved Valentine. But the accomplice shall become the avenger. This fourth murder is apparent to all, and if thy father abandon thee, Valentine, it is I, and I swear it, that shall pursue the assassin. And this time, as though nature had at least taken compassion on the vigorous frame, nearly bursting with its own strength, the words of Morel were stifled in his throat. His breast heaved, the tears so long rebellious gushed from his eyes, and he threw himself weeping on the knees, excuse me, on his knees by the side of the bed. Then Darvigny spoke, and I too, he exclaimed in a low voice, I unite with Monsieur Morel in demanding justice for crime. My blood boils at the idea of having encouraged a murderer by my cowardly concession. Oh, merciful heavens, murmured Villefort. Morel raised his head and reading the eyes of the old man, which gleamed with unnatural luster. Stay, he said. Monsieur Noirtier wishes to speak. Yes, indicated Noirtier, with an expression the more terrible from all his faculties being centered in his glance. Do you know the assassin? asked Morel. Yes, replied Noirtier. Noirtier. And will you direct us? exclaimed the young man. Listen, Monsieur d'Avrigny. Listen! Noirtier looked upon Morel with one of those melancholy smiles which had so often made Valentine happy, and thus fixed his attention. Then, having riveted the eyes of his interlocutor on his own, he glanced towards the door. Do you wish me to leave? said Morel, sadly. Yes, replied Noirtier. Alas, alas, sir, have pity on me. The old man's eyes remained fixed on the door. May I at least return? asked Morel. Yes. Must I leave alone? No. Whom am I to take with me? The procurer? No. The doctor? Yes. You wish to remain alone with Monsieur de Villefort? Yes. But can he understand you? Yes. Oh, said Villefort, inexpressibly delighted to think that the inquiries were to be made by him alone. Oh, be satisfied. I can understand my father. While, ex while uttering these words with this expression of joy, his teeth clashed together violently. D'Avrigny took the young man's arm and led him out of the room. A more than death-like silence then reigned in the house. At the end of a quarter of an hour, a faltering footstep was heard, and Villefort appeared at the door of the apartment where D'Avrigny and Morel had been staying, one absorbed in meditation, the other in grief. You can come, he said, and led them back to Noirtier. Morel looked attentively on Villefort. His face was livid. Large drops rolled down his face, and in his fingers he held the fragments of a quill pen, which he had torn to atoms. Gentlemen, he said in a hoarse voice, give me your word of honor that this horrible secret shall forever remain buried amongst ourselves. The two men drew back. I entreat you, continued Villefort. But, said Morel, the culprit, the murderer, the assassin. Do not alarm yourself, sir. Justice will be done, said Villefort. My father has revealed the culprit's name. My father thirsts for revenge as much as you do, as much as you do, yet even he conjures you as I do to keep this secret. Do you not, father? Yes, resolutely replied Noirtier. Morel suffered an exclamation of horror and surprise to escape him. Oh, sir, said Villefort, arresting Maximilian by the arm, if my father, the inflexible man, makes this request, it is because he knows, be assured, that Valentine will be terribly revenged. 
Is it not so, father? The old man made a sign in the affirmative. Villefort continued, He knows me, and I have pledged my word to him. Rest assured, gentlemen, that within three days, in a less time than justice would demand, the revenge I shall have taken for the murder of my child will be such as to make the boldest heart tremble. And as he spoke these words, he ground his teeth and grasped the old man's senseless hand. Will this promise be fulfilled, Monsieur Noirtier? asked Morel, while d'Avrigny looked inquiringly. Yes, replied Noirtier, with an expression of sinister joy. Swear then, said Villefort, joining the hands of Morel and d'Avrigny, swear that you will spare the honor of my house and leave me to avenge my child. D'Avrigny turned round and uttered a very feeble, yes. But Morel, disengaging his hand, rushed to the bed, and after having pressed the cold lips of Valentine with his own, hurriedly left, uttering a long, deep groan of despair and anguish. We have before stated that all the servants had fled. Monsieur de Villefort was therefore obliged to request Monsieur d'Avrigny to superintend all the arrangements consequent upon a death in a large city, more especially a death under such suspicious circumstances. It is something terrible to witness the silent agony, the mute despair of Noirtier, whose tears silently rolled down his cheeks. Villefort retired to his study, and d'Avrigny left to summon the doctor of the mayorality, whose office it is to examine bodies after decease, and who is expressly named the doctor of the dead. Monsieur Noirtier could not be persuaded to quit his grandchild. At the end of a quarter of an hour, Monsieur d'Avrigny returned with his associate. They found the outer gate closed and not a servant remaining in the house. Villefort himself was obliged to open to them, but he stopped on the landing. He had not the courage to again visit the death, the death chamber. The two doctors, therefore, entered the room alone. Noirtier was near the bed, pale, motionless, and silence, silent as the corpse. The district doctor approached with the indifference of a man accustomed to spend half his time amongst the dead. He then lifted the sheet which was placed over the face and just unclosed the lips. Alas, said d'Avrigny, she is indeed dead, poor child. Yes, answered the doctor, laconically, dropping the sheet he had raised. Noirtier uttered a kind of hoarse, rattling sound. The old man's eyes sparkled, and the good doctor understood that he wished to behold his child. He therefore approached the bed, and while his companion was dipping the fingers with which he had touched the lips of the corpse in chloride of lime, he uncovered the calm and pale face which looked like that of a sleeping angel. A tear which appeared in the old man's eye expressed his thanks to the doctor. The doctor of the dead then laid his permit on the corner of the table, and having fulfilled his duty was conducted out by d'Avrigny. Villefort met them at the door of his study, Having in a few words thanked the district doctor, he turned to d'Avrigny and said, And now, the priest. Is there any particular priest you wish to pray with Valentine? asked d'Avrigny. No, said Villefort. Fetch the nearest. The nearest, said the district doctor, is a good Italian abbe who lives next door to you. Shall I call on him as I pass? D'Avrigny, said Villefort, be so kind, I beseech you, as to accompany this gentleman. Here is the key of the door, so that you can go in and out as you please. You will bring the priest with you, and will oblige me by introducing him into my child's room. Do you wish to see him? I only wish to be alone. You will excuse me, will you not? A priest can understand a father's grief. And Monsieur de Villefort, giving the key to d'Avrigny, again bade farewell to the strange doctor and retired to his study, where he began to work. For some temperaments, work is a remedy for all afflictions. As the doctors entered the street, they saw a man in a cassock standing on the threshold of the next door. This is the abbe of whom I spoke, said the doctor to d'Avrigny. D'Avrigny accosted the priest. Sir, he said, are you disposed to confer a great obligation on an unhappy father who has just lost his daughter? I mean Monsieur de Villefort, the king's attorney. Ah, said the priest in a marked Italian accent. Yes, I have heard that death is in that house. Then I need not tell you what kind of service he requires of you. I was about to offer myself, sir, said the priest. 
It is our mission to forestall our duties. It is a young girl. I know it, sir. The servants who fled from the house informed me. I also know that her name is Valentine, and I have already prayed for her. Thank you, sir, said D'Avrigny. Since you have commenced your sacred office, deign to continue it. Come and watch by the dead, and all the wretched family will be grateful to you. I am going, sir, and I do not hesitate to say that no prayers will be more fervent than mine. D'Avrigny took the priest's hand, and without meeting Villefort, who was engaged in his study, they reached Valentine's room, which on the following night was to be occupied by the undertakers. On entering the room, Noirtier's eyes met those of the abbe, and no doubt he read some particular expression in them, for he remained in the room. D'Avrigny recommended the attention of the priest to the living as well as to the dead, and the abbe promised to devote his prayers to Valentine and his attentions to Noirtier. In order, doubtless, that he might not be disturbed while fulfilling his sacred mission, the priest rose as soon as D'Avrigny departed, and not only bolted the door through which the doctor had just left, but also that leading to Madame de Villefort's room. And now, chapter 104, Danglars' Signature. The next morning dawned dull and cloudy. During the night, the undertakers had executed their melancholy office and wrapped the corpse in the winding sheet, which, whatever may be said about the equality of death, is at least a last proof of the luxury so pleasing in life. This winding sheet was nothing more than a beautiful piece of cambric which the young girl had bought a fortnight before. During the evening, two men engaged for the purpose had carried Noirtier from Valentine's room into his own, and contrary to all expectation, there was no difficulty in withdrawing him from his child. The Abbe Bussoni had watched till daylight and then left without calling anyone. D'Avrigny returned about eight o'clock in the morning. He met Villefort on his way to Noirtier's room and accompanied him to see how the old man had slept. They found him in the large armchair which served him for a bed, enjoying a calm, nay, almost a smiling sleep. They both stood in amazement at the door. See, si, said D'Avrigny to Villefort, Nature knows how to alleviate the deepest sorrow. No one can say that Monsieur Noirtier did not love his child, and yet he sleeps. Yes, you are right, replied Villefort, surprised. He sleeps indeed, and this is the more strange, since the least contradiction keeps him awake all night. Grief has stunned him, replied D'Avrigny, and they both returned thoughtfully to the procurer's study. See, I, I have not slept, said Villefort, showing his undisturbed bed. Grief does not stun me. I have not been in bed for two nights. But then look at my desk. See what I have been sorry, see what I have written during these two days and nights. I have filled these papers and have made out the accusation against the assassin Benedetto. Oh, work, work, my passion, my joy, my delight. It is for thee to alleviate my sorrows and he convulsively grasped the hand of D'Avrigny. Do you require my services now? asked D'Avrigny. No, said Villefort. Only return again at eleven o'clock. At twelve, the, the, oh heavens, my poor, poor child. And the procurer again became a man, lifted up his hands and groaned, excuse me, lifted up his eyes and groaned. Shall you be present in the reception room? No, I have a cousin who has undertaken this sad office. I shall work, doctor. When I work, I forget everything. And indeed, no sooner had the doctor left the room than he was again absorbed in his work. On the footsteps, Daver excuse me, on the doorsteps, Daverny met the cousin whom Villefort had mentioned, a personage as insignificant in our story as in the world he occupied, one of those beings designed from their birth to make themselves useful to others. He was punctual, dressed in black, with crepe around his hat, and presented himself at his cousin's with a face made up for the occasion, in which he could alter as might be required. At eleven o'clock, the morning coaches rolled into the paved court, and the Rue des Faubourg saint honore was filled with a crowd of idlers, equally pleased to witness the festivities or the mourning of the rich, and who rush with the same avidity to a funeral procession as to the marriage of a duchess. Gradually, the reception room filled, and some of our old friends made their, made their appearance. We mean Debray, Chateau Renault, and Beauchamp, accompanied by all the leading men of the day at the bar, in literature, or the army, 
for Monsieur de Villefort moved in the first Parisian circles, less owing to his social position than to his personal merit. The cousin standing at the door ushered in the guests, and it was rather a relief to the indifferent to see a person as unmoved as themselves, and who did not exact a mournful face or forced tears, as would have been the case with a father, a brother, or a lover. Those who were acquainted soon formed into little groups. One of them was made of Debray, Chateau Renault, and Beauchamp. Poor girl, said Debray, like the rest, paying an involuntary tribute to the sad event. Poor girl, so young, so rich, so beautiful. Could you have imagined this scene, Chateau Renault, when we saw her at the most three weeks ago about to sign that contract? Indeed, no, said Chateau Renault. Did you know her? I spoke to her once or twice at Madame de Morcerf's. Among the rest, she appeared to me charming, although rather melancholy. Where is her stepmother, do you know? She is spending the day with the wife of the worthy gentleman who is receiving us. Who is he? Whom do you mean? The gentleman who receives us. Is he a deputy? Oh, no, I am condemned to witness those gentlemen every day, said Beauchamp. But he is perfectly unknown to me. Have you mentioned this death in your paper? It has been mentioned, but the article is not mine. Indeed, I doubt if it will please Monsieur Villefort, for it says that if four successive deaths had happened anywhere else than in the house of the king's attorney, he would have interested himself somewhat more about it. Still, said Chateau Renaud, Dr. Davrigny, who attends my mother, declares he is in despair about it. But whom are you seeking, Debray? I am seeking the Count of Monte Cristo, said the young man. I met him on the boulevard on my way here, said Beauchamp. I think he's about to leave Paris. He was going to his banker. His banker? Danglars is his banker, is he not? asked Chateau Renaud of Debray. I believe so, replied the secretary with slight uneasiness. But Monte Cristo is not the only one I miss here. I do not see Morel. Morel? Do they know him? asked Chateau Renaud. I think he has only been introduced to Madame de Villefort. Still, he ought to have been here, said Debray. I wonder what will be talked about tonight. This funeral is the news of the day, but hush, here comes our minister of justice. He will feel obliged to make some little speech to the cousin, and the three young men drew near to listen. Beauchamp told the truth when he said that on his way to the funeral he had met Monte Cristo, who was directing his steps toward the Rue de la Chaussée d'Antin to Monsieur Danglars. The banker saw the carriage of the Count enter the courtyard and advanced to meet him with a sad, though affable, smile. Well, said he, extending his hand to Monte Cristo, I suppose you have come to sympathize with me, for indeed misfortune has taken possession of my house. When I perceived you, I was just asking myself whether I had whether I had not wished harm towards those poor Morcerfs, which would have justified the proverb of he who wishes misfortunes to happen to others experiences them himself. Well, on my word of honor, I answered no. I wished no ill to Morcerf. He was a little proud, perhaps, for a man who, like myself, has risen from nothing. But we all have our faults. Do you know, Count, that persons of our time, not that you belong to the class, you are still a young man, but as I was saying, persons of our time of life have been very for very unfortunate this year. For example, look at the puritanical procurer who has just lost his daughter, and in fact nearly all his family, in so singular a manner. Morcerf, dishonored and dead, and then myself covered with ridicule through the villainy of Benedetto. Besides... Besides what? asked the Count. Alas, do you not know? What new calamity? My daughter. Mademoiselle Danglars? Eugenie has left us. Good heavens, what are you telling me? The truth, my dear Count. Oh, how happy you must be in not having either wife or children. Do you think so? Indeed I do. And so, Mademoiselle Danglars, she could not endure the insult offered to us by that wretch, so she asked permission to travel. And is she gone? The other night she left. With Madame Danglars? No, with a relation. But still we have quite lost our dear Eugenie, for I doubt whether her pride will ever allow her to return to France. 
still, Baron, said Monte Cristo, family griefs, or indeed any other affliction which would crush a man whose child was his only treasure, are endurable to a millionaire. Philosophers may well say, and practical men will always support the opinion, that money mitigates many trials, and if you admit the efficacy of this sovereign balm, you ought to be very easily consoled, you, the king of finance, the focus of immeasurable power. Danglars looked at him askance, as though to ascertain whether he spoke seriously. Yes, he answered, if a fortune brings consolation, I ought to be consoled. I am rich. So rich, dear sir, that your fortune resembles the pyramids. If you wish to demolish them, you could not, and if it were possible, you would not dare. Danglars smiled at the good-natured pleasantry of the Count. And that reminds me, he said, that when you entered, I was on the point of signing five little bonds. I have already signed two. Will you allow me to do the same to the others? Pray do so. There was a moment's silence during which the noise of the banker's pen was alone heard, while Monte Cristo examined the gilt mouldings on the ceiling. Are they Spanish, Haitian, or Neapolitan bonds? said Monte Cristo. No, said Danglars, smiling. They are bonds on the Bank of France, payable to bearer. Stay, Count, he added. You, who may be called the Emperor, if I claim the title of King of Finance, have you many pieces of paper of this size, each worth a million? The Count took into his pan, excuse me, the Count took into his hands the papers which Danglars had so proudly presented to him and read, To the Governor of the Bank, Please pay to my order from the fund deposited by me the sum of a million and charge the same to my account. Baron Danglars. One, two, three, four, five, said Monte Cristo. Five millions. Why, what a crocious you are. This is how I transact business, said Danglars. It is really wonderful, said the Count. Above all, if, as I suppose, it is payable at sight, it is indeed, said Danglars. It is a fine thing to have such credit. Really, it is only in France these things are done. Five millions on five little scraps of paper. It must be seen to be believed. You do not doubt it? No. You say so with an accent. Stay, you shall be convinced. Take my clerk to the bank, and you will see him leave it with an order on the treasury for the same sum. No, said Monte Cristo, folding the five notes. Most decidedly not. The thing is so curious, I will make the experiment myself. I am credited on you for six millions. I have drawn nine hundred thousand francs. You therefore still owe me five millions and a hundred thousand francs. I will take the five scraps of paper that I now hold as bonds with your signature alone. And here is a receipt in full for the six millions between us. I had prepared it beforehand, for I am much in want of money today. And Monte Cristo placed the bonds in his pocket with one hand, while with the other he held out the receipt to Danglars. If a thunderbolt had fallen at the banker's feet, he could not have experienced greater terror. What? he stammered. Do you mean to keep that money? Excuse me, excuse me, but I owe this money to the charity fund a deposit which I promised to pay this morning. Oh, well then, said Monte Cristo, I am not particular about these five notes. Pay me in a different form. I wished from curiosity to take these, that I might be able to say that without any advice or preparation, the house of Danglars had paid me five millions without a minute's delay. It would have been remarkable. But here are your bonds. Pay me differently. And he held the bonds towards Danglars, who seized them like a vulture extending its claws to withhold the food that is being wrested from its grasp. Suddenly, he rallied, made a violent effort to restrain himself, and then a smile gradually widened the features of his disturbed countenance. Certainly, he said, your receipt is money. Oh, dear, yes. And if you were at Rome, the house of Thompson and French would make no more difficulty about paying the money on my receipt than you have just done. Pardon me, Count. Pardon me. Then I may keep this money? Yes, said Danglars, while the perspiration started from the roots of his hair. Yes, keep it. Keep it. 
Monte Cristo replaced the notes in his pocket with that indescribable expression which seemed to say, Come, reflect. If you repent, there is still time. No, said Danglars. No, decidedly no. Keep my signatures. But you know none are so formal as bankers in transacting business. I intended this money for the charity fund, and I seemed to be robbing them if I did not pay them with these precise bonds. How absurd, as if one crown were not as good as another. Excuse me. And he began to laugh loudly, but nervously. Certainly I excuse you, said Monte Cristo graciously, and pocket them. And he placed the bonds in his pocketbook. But, said Danglars, there was still a sum of one hundred thousand francs. Oh, a mere nothing, said Monte Cristo. The balance would come to about that sum, but keep it, and we shall be quits. Count, said Danglars, are you speaking seriously? I never joke with bankers, said Monte Cristo, in a freezing manner, which repelled impertinence, and he turned to the door just as the valet de chambre announced, Monsieur de Beauville, receiver general of the charities. Ma foi, said Monte Cristo, I think I arrived just in time to obtain your signatures, or they would have been disputed with me. Danglars again became pale and hastened to conduct the count out. Monte Cristo exchanged a ceremonious bow with Monsieur de Beauville, who was standing in the waiting room, and who was introduced into Danglars' room as soon as the count had left. The count's serious face was illumined by a faint smile as he noticed the portfolio which the receiver general held in his hand. At the door he found his carriage and was immediately driven to the bank. Meanwhile, Danglars, repressing all emotion, advanced, advanced to meet the receiver general. We need not say that a smile of condescension was stamped upon his lips. Good morning, creditor, said he, for I wager anything it is the creditor who visits me. You are right, Baron, answered Monsieur de Beauville. The charities present themselves to you through me. The widows and orphans depute me to receive alms to the amount of five millions from you. And yet they say orphans are to be pitied, said Danglars, wishing to prolong the jest. Poor things. Here I am in their name, said Monsieur de Beauville. But did you receive my letter yesterday? Yes. I have brought my receipt. Uh, my dear Monsieur de Beauville, your widows and orphans must oblige me by waiting twenty-four hours. Since Monsieur de Monte Cristo, whom you just saw leaving, you did see him, I think? Yes, well. Well, Monsieur de Monte Cristo has just carried off their five millions. How so? The Count has an unlimited credit upon me, a credit opened by Thompson and French of Rome. He came to demand five millions at once, which I paid him with checks on the bank. My funds are deposited there, and you can understand that if I draw out ten millions on the same day, it will appear rather strange to the governor. Two days will be a different thing, said Danglars, smiling. Come, said Beauville, with a tone of entire incredulity. Five millions to that gentleman who just left, and who bowed to me as though he knew me? Perhaps he knows you, though you do not know him. Monsieur de Monte Cristo knows everybody. Five millions. Here is his receipt. Believe your own eyes. Monsieur de Beauville took the paper Danglars presented him and read, Received of Baron Danglars the sum of five million one hundred thousand francs to be repaid on demand by the house of Thompson and French of Rome. It is really true, said Monsieur de Beauville. Do you know the house of Thompson and French? Yes. I once had business to transact with it to the amount of two hundred thousand francs. But since then I have not heard it mentioned. It is one of the best houses in Europe, said Danglars, carelessly throwing down the receipt on his desk. And he had five millions in your hands alone. Why, this Count of Monte Cristo must be a nabob? Indeed, I do not know what he is. He has three unlimited credits, one on me, one on Rothschild, one on the feet. And you see, he added carelessly, he has given me the preference by leaving a balance of 100,000 francs. Monsieur de Beauville manifested signs of extraordinary admiration. I must visit him, he said, and obtain some pious grant from him. Oh, you may make sure of him. His charities alone amount to 20,000 francs a month. It is magnificent. 
I will set before him the example of Madame de Morcerf and her son. What example? They gave all their fortune to the hospitals. What fortune? Their own, Monsieur de Morcerf's, who is deceased. For what reason? Because they would not spend money so guiltily acquired. And what are they to live upon? The mother retires into the country, and the son enters the army. Well, I must confess, these are scruples. I registered their deed of gift yesterday. And how much did they possess? Oh, not much, from twelve to thirteen hundred thousand francs. But to return to our millions. Certainly, said Danglars in the most natural tone in the world. Are you then pressed for this money? Yes, for the examination of our cash takes place tomorrow. Tomorrow? Why did you not tell me so before? Why, it is as good as a century. At what hour does the examination take place? At two o'clock. Send at twelve, said Danglars, smiling. Monsieur de Beauville said nothing, but nodded his head and took up the portfolio. Now I think of it, you can do better, said Danglars. How do you mean? The receipt of Monsieur de Monte Cristo is as good as money. Take it to Rothschilds or Lafitte's, and they will take it off your hands at once. What? Though payable at Rome? Certainly. It will only cost you a discount of five thousand or six thousand francs. The receiver started back. Ma foi, he said. I prefer waiting till tomorrow. What a proposition. I thought, perhaps, said Danglars with supreme impertinence, that you had a deficiency to make up. Indeed, said the receiver, and if there were the case, it would be worth while to make some sacrifice. Thank you. No, sir. Then it will be tomorrow. Yes, but without fail. Ah, you are laughing at me. Send tomorrow at twelve, and the bank shall be notified. I will come myself. Better still, since it will afford me the pleasure of seeing you. They shook hands. By the way, said Monsieur de Beauville, are you not going to the funeral of poor Mademoiselle de Villefort, which I met on my road here? No, said the banker. I have appeared rather ridiculous since that affair of Benedetto, so I remain in the background. Bah, you are wrong. How are you to blame in that affair? Listen, when one bears an irreproachable name, as I do, one is rather sensitive. Everybody pities you, sir, and above all, Mademoiselle Danglars. Poor Eugenie, said Danglars. Do you know she is going to embrace a religious life? No. Alas, it is unhappily but too true. The day after the event, she decided on leaving Paris with a nun of her acquaintance. They are gone to seek a very strict convent in Italy or Spain. Oh, it is terrible, said Monsieur de Beauville, and Monsieur de Beauville retired with this exclamation after expressing acute sympathy with the father. But he had scarcely left before Danglars with an energy of action those can alone understand who have seen Robert Macaire represented by Frederic, exclaimed, Fool! Then enclosing Monte Cristo's receipt in a little pocket book, he added, Yes, come at twelve o'clock. I shall then be far away. Then he double locked his doors, emptied all his drawers, collected about fifty thousand francs in bank notes, burned several papers, left others exposed to view, and then commenced writing a letter which he addressed to Madame la Baronne Danglars. I will place it on her table myself tonight, he murmured. Then taking a passport from his drawer, he said, good, it is available for two months longer. Okay. So Baron Danglars is getting ready to run away, leaving debts unpaid. Um, Valentine de Villefort has died, and they are getting ready to bury her. Oh, it's been a crazy day. All right, so, so much happening. I'll see you tomorrow for two chapters. Um, they are a little longer than today's reading, so we will probably stretch out just a little over the hour again. But I hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you for joining me. And then after that, we just have one more week of reading. It's so exciting. Okay, so go ahead. Um, please continue to vote on what book you'd like to read next. If there isn't a title there that you're interested in, nominate it. It just needs to be something in the public domain. So published in 1924 or before that. So thank you very much for joining me today. I look forward to joining you tomorrow for reading. And one more week only will conclude our read along together of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Yay! Thank you so much for joining me. Bye!